Hello everyone, I'm Susan Lee McDonald and welcome back to my show, The Interview. Dreamers stay young and energetic, kind of like a Peter Pan that never grows old. My guest today, Michael Hope, is a dreamer whose musical compositions have really influenced so many Koreans here and he is beloved throughout Korea. Michael has had an incredible career as an A&R head for Polygram for over 15 years, signing on acts like ABBA, The Who and more. And now, as a pianist and composer, his works are wowing audiences all over Korea, making him a beloved composer. I'm really looking forward to meeting an industry great and a beloved composer and musician, Michael Hope. Join me for the interview right now. Behind famous artists such as ABBA, The Who, and Vangelis, was a renowned producer at Polygram Records, Michael Hope. After a 15-year career as a prominent producer, he took on the new challenge of reinventing himself as an artist. He debuted in 1988 with his album Quiet Storm, and for the past 26 years, he has been composing and playing piano, communicating with his audience through the universal language of music. The interview reveals Michael Hope's philosophy on music and the melodies that offer solace and peace. Michael, thank you so much for being on the interview. Thank you for being my guest today. Well, Susan, I'm delighted to be here. Very you nice. know, um, so many people in Korea have really just loved a lot of your music. And I know that you're visiting for the umpteenth time to Korea. The fifth, fifth yes. time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, you're here for just a super short trip. But uh, thank you for making the time to, to come on. Oh, my pleasure. I mean, um, for me to come and play my music and basically uh, uh, although I obviously don't speak Korean, uh, I speak heart and uh, I find it very easy to speak that language with the Korean people and, I, and that's why for me it's an absolute joy to come here. Wonderful. Really beautiful, e easy. <laughs> mm. Well, you are here for a short trip now. What brings you to Korea this time around? Um, my new record company is Hux Music and they have uh, organized a concert for me on Sunday mm -hmm. at the LG um, Auditorium. And um, they said, Michael, you were here last year, why not come over and, and sort of perform here with some Korean instrumentalists? Mm -hmm. So we've got um, some marvelous, there's a violinist, a cellist, and a, a haigum, and a flute, and a harmonica, and all these instruments um, are played by young Korean instrumentalists and uh, marvelous musicians. Mm. So uh, for me, this is something actually very, um, very exciting. I'm not sort of getting up there playing the piano by myself. I'm, I'm actually playing with these wonderful musicians. So you're uh, somewhat collaborating with these artists yes, on I am. stage? Yeah, it's uh, my music, which they have uh, so kindly learned um, uh, because my sight reading is very bad. So I don't actually sit there and read the music, mm -hmm. but they very kindly learned it. And um, it's, um, yeah. I mean, many of the pieces will be familiar to this audience, I would think, but to hear it performed so beautifully by these young people is wonderful. I'm sure that the Korean uh, performers uh, are really excited for the chance to play your music and also uh, with the diverse instruments that, uh, that you've yeah. mentioned. Uh, it sounds like it's going to be quite, quite a crowd. Well, yeah. I mean, what, what's um, exciting, Susan, is when you hear somebody who's really good, mm -hmm and they, uh, they take your theme and run with it, uh, that is really exciting. I mean, I've always had a sort of a rule when I'm recording, basically, um, if my music is better than the performance, mm -hmm. then we do not have a recording. Mm. But when they are better than my music, they sort of elevate it, mm -hmm. then we have something really exciting. What is it about performing that excites you? Is it uh, the kind of communication between you and the audience? Is it between you and the other performers on stage? 
Well, it's all that, of course, but it also, Susan, it, it's new for me. Mm -hmm. It's not something I've been doing very often. I mean, I come here, I, I think, the fifth time. Um, and you would say, well, Michael, why don't you perform more often in Portland? Well, I, somehow I find myself not doing that. So this is one of the things that I enjoy at my age, is to experience something new and, as I said, to give something back mm -hmm. and to share it. And that, that's really why I'm here. That's, that's, for me, the exciting part of it all. Yeah. Now, in the past, when you've performed here in Korea, um, and you've been here a number of times to do certain uh, performances, uh, what has been your experience with the audience's uh, reactions afterwards? Oh, wonderful. Wonderful. Oh, yeah. I mean, Susan, they get it. Mm. They get it. It is a real language. I mean, it's a language of the heart. And, and it's, I don't have to explain myself or excuse myself um, or describe anything. It is absolutely felt. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and because I'm feeling that they're feeling it and we're all feeling it together, it's a sort of euphoria. Mm -hmm. And that's all I can, you know, what more can one want? And, uh, it's like a, a feeling of uh, being able to create with, with, yeah, with I mean, someone else. You're, you're speaking to people's hearts. Mm -hmm. And if they're moved to tears, which is for me the, the height of, um, sort of um, achievement in a way, when mm -hmm. somebody listens to my music and, and walks out and goes and makes some sort of spaghetti, um, that's not happening. But if they actually are moved to the mm -hmm. point that they move to tears, mm -hmm. I think that I have reached their heart. And, and I find that with this, uh, with the people here, with the Korean people, uh, I can ac access their hearts remarkably easily, mm -hmm. and they can mine. And mm -hmm. it's, that is the whole sort of uh, euphoria I'm talking about, yeah. Because I come from a very strict English background, mm -hmm. where sort of overly romantic music it was not really accepted. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and appreciate it. And so coming here um, and knowing how the Korean people um, uh, appreciate what I do mm -hmm. has been enormous psychological um, freedom for me to be accepted. From what I understand, your first concert was here in Korea in 2002. Tell yeah. me about that. Yeah. It was, um, I had come with my wife in 2000 for a sort of promotion. Mm -hmm. Um, but it wasn't a concert. It was not. It was just purely doing some TV shows and mm -hmm. stuff. And um, in 2002, for the first time, I was actually asked over. To, I think it was a Seoul Art Centre, mm -hmm. which is rather a large place. Yes. And in fact, that was the first time I'd ever sat in front of an audience to perform my music. That must have been well, so nerve-wracking. <laughs> it, it was. It, it really was. But I, um, I sort of got through it, and I really wanted to try and do something I'd never done before. And I think this is one of the most important things of, um, oh, I don't know, growing perhaps, but it's doing things which you feel um, you, th you couldn't do or haven't mm -hmm. done, and you do them. It doesn't matter how old you are, and it doesn't matter how frightening it is, and it's an enormous personal achievement to overcome those reluctances that you might have had. Mm -hmm. um, so well, you, you've been in the music business for many years, and you've helped many people yeah. kind of get yeah. to the point where they're performing yeah. and producing their albums. And yeah. now that you were the one <laughs> yes, on I, stage, yeah, yeah, I was. I, I, mean, so I was always much happier being behind the screen mm -hmm. and and and, in, and supporting others to do it. Um, I never was one particularly for walking out in front of the stage, um, although I don't mind it when I do it. Um, so it was a uh, switching of the roles um, yeah, for me to actually, okay, here I am. <laughs> you know, I can't hide my sign to somebody else. And uh, so that was uh, a huge bridge that I crossed in 2002. Performing here in Korea, you, I'm sure, have come across some Korean songs too. Mm. And uh, I'm curious what type of Korean songs have maybe caught and got your attention? Um, have you incorporated some Korean songs, whether they're children's songs or um, traditional songs, into some of your repertoire? Yeah, well, what's so um, beautiful as well 
that the many of the folk songs are, have a Western flavor, mm -hmm. as you know, and um, well, why, I don't know, but they do. Um, I, one of the encores that I have a chance to play it will be a Korean a folk tune on Sunday. Um, they May I ask which one that is? I, yeah, it's the little child on an island or something. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, they're sort of almost um, sweet, childlike um, tunes, very often they are. But what, you know, what is a great thing about folk music mm -hmm. is that it's been, all the notes have been perfected by time. Mm -hmm. All the wrong notes have long since been eradicated. So you have a sort of a complete beautiful tune like Ariang or and others mm -hmm. and uh, where every note is perfect and um, this is very much where I come from as a composer, mm -hmm. melodically. Mm -hmm. I had to write a the perfect Mm, that's it. There's no form of fluff. Yes. There's no form of um, unnecessary notes. Mm -hmm. and, uh, Just the right ingredients. Completely. Yeah. And so, so I find a lot of Korean folk music, uh, music that's been perfected by time mm -hmm. and beautiful. Mm. Yeah. Now, when you're performing some of these uh, Korean tunes, um, uh, is there a, a special uh, feeling from the heart that you're communicating with the audience? Um, yes. I mean, it's, a, it's a sometimes a sort of melody that I could have written myself. Mm -hmm. So therefore it's not a great extension of sort of unusualness. I feel very familiar and very mm -hmm. at home um, playing th this music. And in 2008, from what I understand, you also performed with Korean traditional instruments at that time too. Yeah, I did. It's, um, I, d I did one piece um, in Portland mm -hmm. using a koto, which is a Japanese instrument. It's sort I of see, wow. Mm -hmm. And she was a marvelous, marvelous player. So I thought, okay, we'll adapt the music that I did with the koto to the, the instrument here in Korea. The kaigum? Uh, th that's right, mm -hmm. the kaigum. And, and I'll have another instrument, um, I, I think it was the um, kaigum, playing on top. Uh -huh. well. And so the instruments, with me playing behind yes. my music, but the Korean exotic sounds, mm -hmm. it was a lovely. It was fantastic, wow. fantastic. You got this sort of Western theme mm -hmm. with all these Korean beautiful sort of sonic spicings, I call them. Mm -hmm. Making I love that sort of term, sonic yeah, spicings. Yeah, <laughs> you know, magic, magic. Now, do you feel that uh, you're able to kind of really connect with a lot of the Korean kind of sentimentality and the Korean feeling as, as they're playing their instruments? Yeah, yeah. I really do. I, and that's what I call part language. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's no something I have to excuse myself mm -hmm. on, you know. Um, I'm sorry if this is very sentimental and uh, et cetera. I, no, um, this is something which is fully, fully mm -hmm. embraced here. Earlier I asked you about the uh, kind of sentiments of uh, the traditional Korean music's uh, influence on people and mm. how a lot of times Koreans describe this kind of sentimentality as something called Han. Mm. Have you heard of yes, Han? Yes, It's very that much feeling so. of deep sorrow. Yes, yes. Um, how would you explain Han? It's a suspension of notes. Mm -hmm. um, it's a note that wants to come home, mm. and you and it can't come home, and you leave it hanging out there for a long time. This gives you, even sonically, a sort of a form of a heartache. Mm -hmm. um, hum is sort of, yes, it has a, a melancholy uh, aspect to it, and my music does. I, I have no idea why. I'm quite happy. I'm not sort of, you know, mm -hmm. not something I, I, I dwell in sadness or anything like this. Um, but I, if I'm to be moved, mm -hmm. That's the only thing that moves me. I'm not moved by sort of happy, bouncy music. I, I mean, I, great, but it's not what I get off on. And um, so, um, the, the unrequited love, the the something which is like a mirage, you can never quite quite get there. The longing, like longing, the yearning, yeah. and all those things. Susan, I really know what that's about, mm -hmm. and I can't tell you why I have that. Why I have it, I have no idea. Mm -hmm. But I think that's why the Koreans have this, uh, this, this hun, as you describe it, and my music does too. Um, yeah, when we do listen to your music, um, I, f I find that there is a lot of that, uh, that longing and that kind yeah. of desire to, to grasp something yeah, yeah. that is elusive. Yeah, <laughs> it's, a sort of, um, it's got one foot in nostalgia, I suppose. Um, it's the unrequitedness, but I can't tell you 
why I do it. I, um, and it's not all my music, it's not all like that. Mm -hmm. But I know there's an element in it. And, um, but I mean, I can go to a, a piano and I can show you mm -hmm. how you can get that sort of feeling mm -hmm. um, even outside of composition. You know, mm -hmm. I can play, I can say, see, now, now that suspension, um, those sort of juxtaposition of notes gives you a sense of, mm. Mm -hmm. and that's what it's about. And then if you can organize all that, mm, into a composition, then that's what you have as music. Wow. That's what I do. Tell us a little bit about the background for the Renouncement. Yeah, Renouncement I actually I wrote for my daughter oh. and she's a very gifted uh, photographer. Her name is Rebecca and um, that was sort of her theme and um, it's uh, I think one of my best themes. Um, I originally wrote it for cello so it's got a bomb so you can hear the sort of octave leap going downwards and so with a cello in mind and, um, and so I recorded it with that instrument and then eventually with, recorded with the Prague Symphony. Mm -hmm. And I think it's one of my sort of favorite recordings. Wow. Michael, you've also written a couple of uh, songs that have really touched the Koreans' hearts. Uh, and the one in particular called Prayer for Tokdo. Oh, yeah. I'm curious how you found out about uh, the Tokdo Islands. Yeah. Uh, I know there's a dispute that's been going on for quite yeah. some time. But how did you decide to write about uh, the prayer for Tokdo? Yeah, you know, good question, Susan, if I may say. I, I never know where um, music comes from. Mm. Every now and then, I do. And this is one of those occasions where it came from a particular situation where I can mm. pinpoint uh, why I did it and what happened. Um, my wife and I were in LA mm -hmm. and I was reading the LA Times and there was an article about the dispute about these islands. Mm -hmm. I found it fascinating. Mm -hmm. and these islands were so small, you couldn't hardly see them on the map, and, uh, and yet there was so much fervor and uh, anger about them, both from the Japanese and the Korean point of view. And I sort of looked and researched it a bit. Mm -hmm. And um, as I was doing this, some wind chimes were playing in our garden. Oh. Clanging away, clong, clang, clang. And, um, it, the, the five notes were what we call sort of an Asian scale. Yes. And I thought, and I was reading this story, and these were clanging away in the wind, bing dong, bang dong. And with those notes in my mind, and the story that I could read, I went to the piano, and I played those five notes on the piano. And from that, developed this piece of music. So completely right inspired by completely. the article? And the, uh, the wind chimes that were random. <laughs> uh, yeah, absolutely. The wind, was, the wind chimes were just a random, uh, extraneous sort of sound, but they, they formed a catalyst for me to actually to make a composition. And you know, Susan, it's one of my favorite. It really is. It's a sort of not quite like I normally do. Um, and uh, it's one of my favorite melodies. And I think that a lot of uh, Koreans were very touched uh, by the fact that you wrote 
this particular song and mm -hmm. that uh, it has a really beautiful kind of uh, magical quality to it and maybe yeah. maybe because it was inspired by the wind chimes and that, yeah. that event? It's a sort of, um, well, it, it, you know, so a piece of music or maybe a piece of art, mm -hmm. um, maybe anything like this, has to make sense, mm -hmm. right? It has to make sense. And uh, this tune makes sense to me. Mm -hmm. It has a beginning and an end and a reason to be, um, as it has an arc to it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I like the song mm -hmm. a lot. And I'm the very happy that it's been accepted here so well. Yeah. So Michael, I'm curious about how you became uh, a producer as well as a composer. And I'm sure it started from your wee young years. Um, you were born in Cairo. Yes. Of all places. Yes, uh, was I was. <laughs> I was indeed. How, how was that uh, um, Well, the case? I guess because my mother was there, that might have been mm -hmm. a good reason. <laughs> but uh, after, after that, um, they came back in a troop ship. It was at the end mm -hmm. of the Second World War. And, uh, and I grew up in London and then went to the normal sort of prep school and mm. public school and, and so on. When I was about 10, I heard the adagio from Beethoven's um, Emperor Concerto, mm. this is fifth. Mm -hmm. And I was 10, you know, and I thought, that's it. That's the music. never listened to all the sort of Connie Francis or whatever else was happening at that time. I, uh, I was completely drawn to the adagios, the largos, or the slow movements of classical concerti. Mm -hmm. And this was for me like a, like a heaven. And uh, I, 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 that's when I thought, yes, this says everything to me. I don't need the crash and bash or the out outside movements and all the sort of fast rondos. It doesn't mean much to me at all. Mm -hmm. But I love the second movement. I love the sort of... Mm. And the adagio from yes. Beethoven's uh, Emperor Concerto mm -hmm. was the catalyst for me to start my basic love affair with all the slow movements. So you say, well, Michael, therefore, your own music is sort of a load of slow movements. Yes, yes. that's correct. So yes. And was it at that time that you started uh, learning how to play an instrument? I learned by so watching and by hearing. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I used to love the sound of the piano. Mm -hmm. And I was called the dreamer. So as a child, you were a daydreamer. And how did this daydreaming boy become one of the most successful producers in the music well, industry? Well, um, it was really um, largely due to my father. Hmm. And uh, he um, was the son of a very famous artist. And um, his father, my grandfather, was a very famous photographer. Interesting. And uh, I think my father hated being about this, uh, being with a self-centered person, hmm. which many artists are. That's how you make your art felt, frankly, is by mm -hmm. always thinking about yourself and pushing yourself, etc. So my father really had no time when his own son was all sort of, oh, I think I'll become an artist, Ted, <laughs> you know. <laughs> no, he, he sort of said, uh, no, Michael, we don't want any of this nonsense. Uh, I think you should go into the army and, and sort of back up. Wow. So, oh, right. Okay, Dad. So, um, and so you I, did. I did. I so sort of obeyed. And my father said, I think you're doing very well. You should stay in. I should stay in the army, Dad? Yes, I think you should. Okay, Dad, um, I think I'll ask the Brigadier, first of all, if I can actually uh, stay in the army. Mm -hmm. uh, I saw the Brigadier, and the Brigadier said, Michael, sit down. Uh -oh. Sir, I, I want to um, stay in the army, and he said, no, sit down. And, uh, Are you I, in trouble? I, I thought, well, am I in trouble? <laughs> he said, uh, look, I don't think you should stay in the army. But I said, but sir, my father thinks, I, I, Michael, look, this is your life. I don't think you should stay in the army. I can see how extremely involved with music you are. Mm -hmm. You don't seem to know about anything else. You don't seem to be involved with anything else except music. I suggest you leave the army and you go into music. Wow. Really, really sir? Yes. But I said, you know, I can't play very well. Is it, Michael? Go. And I think, Susan, when I've, um, I was thinking about this the other day, how incredibly important uh, 
the elder generation, now myself now, uh, can be and are to a young person who sometimes don't, doesn't know too much about what's going on. Uh, the words and the advice that they can give can be tremendously important. And what so you said totally changed your life. Completely. I, I would have stayed in the army, I mean, at least for a few more years. Mm -hmm. And um, so I left. Uh, my father thought, really? And, um, but I always will say, and I say thank you to him even to this day, when Dad said, okay, get into the business of whatever you want to do. I don't think, you know, I don't want to hear about you being a, wanting to be a concert pianist or anything like this. <laughs> All this is it's nonsense. It's so practical sounding. Uh, completely. Well, he, he is or was. And so I joined um, Polygram. So you became a music producer well, straight just, out I, of... I'll I, I tell you what yeah. happened. Um, because I was in the army and I had a lot of time, at that time the army was not in war, mm -hmm. I had therefore a lot of time to listen to LPs, mm. right? And, uh, and I was only 21, and you have all your marbles, you remember everything at mm -hmm. that time. And I listened to hundreds and hundreds and bought hundreds of LPs, Deutsche Grammophon classical wow. recordings. Do you still have them? I just sold them, actually. Oh. I just sold them. <laughs> I just sold them. So, so by the time I had my... Dang. Yeah, yeah, no, they've gone. They were so heavy. But, 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 but in the end, the, um, the polygram said, now we're going to interview about Deutsche Grammophon. Mm -hmm. And I knew more about their catalog than they did because oh, wow. I had sort of listened to it for so long and at the age of 21 and could remember everything. Got the job and they said, right, now, Michael, we do not make our money from classical music. <laughs> oh. But that nope, was your favorite. That's my favorite. No, nope, you've got to um, change and you're going to go into pop music. Pop music? You d I don't know a thing about pop music. <laughs> Michael, look. Uh, we make 90% of our money from pop music. Um, it basically underwrites classical music. I know you love classical music, young man. You've got to learn how we work and how we make money. It is not with classical music. Oh. <laughs> I went into <laughs> pop music. I knew nothing at all about it. But eventually, I became head of A&R. Yes. And, uh, and I was involved with signing people like ABBA and The Who and so on. So. For people who may not understand the significance of what being head of A&R is, mm. I mean, you are the one who basically scouts out the talent and helps yeah. to sign them. I yeah. mean, that yeah. is a very important part yeah. of the, the music business, oh, to extremely. find incredible talent. Yeah. And that was a forte for you, wasn't oh, it? It was. It was, well, it was a, um, it's a very high profile job. Um, you could be fired within months. I mean, you basically are as only good as your last hit. I had um, a couple of um, very lucky hits, um, one after the other. What are some of the other yeah, artists yeah. that you've worked with? Yeah, ABBA. ABBA. When you worked with ABBA, uh, what was your impression of the caliber of their talent? If they hadn't collaborated, if McCartney hadn't got it with Lennon and, and Som, mm -hmm. um, or Elton John with Taupin, uh, all these great songs would not have occurred. So collaboration is incredibly important. And in ABBA, these two, from of different sensibilities, uh, uh, made what ABBA mm -hmm. was and sort of still is. And with some of the uh, other groups, like The Who, for example, yeah. um, when you listened to their music and when you kind of worked with them, uh, what were some things that you noticed about working well, with them? Well, I tell you what was special about The Who is, is with Pete. Mm -hmm. um, it was in Quadrophenia days. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and Pete, I have to say, was the most intelligent um, um, artist I ever met, mm. completely completely mm -hmm. bright. Mm -hmm. uh, as you know, he went deaf mm -hmm. because of all the loud music he had to play really yes. for so long. Um, but for sheer brilliance mm -hmm. and the clarity, and uh, he was uh, above and beyond um, uh, the many of us. I thought he was yeah. superbly intelligent. Yeah. You know. So you have this knack for seeing incredible talent. Yeah. Uh, what do you account that for? Um, instinct. So when somebody comes along to play, I can hear very quickly uh, to what caliber they are at, mm -hmm. very quickly. Um, and uh, 
it's been very, very difficult very often to, uh, to make records, what I do, because people are simply not good enough mm -hmm. for, I ca they're not hearing, I'm not hearing what I have in my head. Mm -hmm. I can't, they're not giving me, whatever. so um, it's a very high caliber, and yes, absolutely right there, Susan, it was all these years of being surrounded with incredibly mm -hmm. gifted people. And um, I had my 15 minutes of fame, as it were, and I was rather quite good at it. The 15 minutes of fame was actually 15 years of working well, well, at Polygram, I which was. is now universal, right? Yes, that's <laughs> correct. Yes, that was universal. Yeah, I did. And I, um, I was there, for, that's right, for 15. And uh, one of my artists who I was signing, uh, called Van Gillis, mm -hmm. he did Chariots of Fire. Absolutely. I love, I absolutely. Love he's the man, he's the man, he's the man. He said, Michael is Greek. Michael, you, you, got to, uh, you do your own music. You, you know, you leave this corporate nonsense behind. Do you do your... Oh, yeah, really? Yes. And uh, I thought, oh, I don't know if I'm courageous enough to do that. And, uh, well, when I was still a Polygram, I went to see Polygram pictures mm -hmm. about a film they were making, mm -hmm. Flashdance. A flash dance. Well, I, I love remember. that movie. Okay. They were doing flash dance too. And I brought in a whole load of music, which I was involved with. And they said, no, 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 no. Thank you. And I said, um, I've got one piece of music that's my own. Michael, we don't have any time to hear this. <laughs> we don't have any time to hear. Though, no, please, I want you to hear this piece of music. It's my own. Michael, you've just said it. And before I could hear any more, I got the Walkman headphones and put them on his head and played the song. Wow. It was the party. And he said, this is fantastic. I said, I know, I know that, <laughs> if you don't mind you me saying. You don't have to tell me. No, 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 but I want, you know, is there a way yeah. you can use this? And he said, we just have a very sad film mm. that needs music very badly. It's with Gene Hackman and Henry Thomas, who was a little boy in E.T. Yes. And I ended up by scoring the film, which I had never done before. Mm -hmm. Therefore, I left Polygram. Wow. That was my first foray into doing my own music and now being a composer. Was, was a, um, a theme I did for a film, and uh, which was never made. And the film was sort of called Never Again, I think. It was about two young girls who really uh, loved each other. They were about ten. Horrible reality came into place when they found that their own parents were having an affair with each other, and therefore their from two separate families, and therefore the, the anguish and the um, collapse of their friendship happened. So the film was to begin with these two girls sitting on the back of a horse, going into the wood, and, uh, and this uh, theme was written for the beginning of the film, and it was about, it has a bittersweet quality, it starts off very childlike to begin with, la 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 la, like a child. And then there's slightly more bittersweetness that happens when both uh, of these two friends realize they really couldn't stand the adult world they were living in. And I don't know how the film was to end, but it was a sort of a bittersweet film. That's how Children's World started, yeah.
when I listen to your music, Michael, I do feel that there is such a beautiful healing quality about it. And I know that I'm not alone in mm. uh, feeling that uh, not only is it beautiful music to listen to, but there is a, a special energy that kind of comes from, um, from the, the compositions. And uh, I'm curious, uh, among all the things that I do want to ask you about your music, yeah. when it comes to composition, are you thinking of how to to, to make music uh, beautifully? Are you thinking of how to create like healing music? No. What's kind of the no. genesis? Uh, no, um, Susan. And initially, I do it entirely for myself. Mm. Um, there's no other reason for it. Um, I do music, which um, I try to do music, which which I find moves me. Mm -hmm. And then I have somebody who can really play to make the music really, really beautiful. So, for example, one of my favorite performers is um, a cellist called Martin Tillman. Mm -hmm. And um, he elevates my music to a superb degree. Uh, Tim Wheater, the also flautist. Mm -hmm. So whenever my music has some um, feeling for you, it has been performed so beautifully by these other musicians. What my job is, is to provide a, a good construction, mm -hmm. a melody which you can drive a truck over and it will still survive. <laughs> you know, this, and, and I'm very, very aware of what a, a good tune is. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not an arranger particularly, and as I said before, I don't read music very well, so it's, not, it's purely instinctive. Mm -hmm. I'm not an idiot savant, but I'm not sort of far from it either. I sort of know what is really the right notes within the type of music I do. Yes. And I just make sure, because of my sort of business training, I suppose, that I get the best performance of what I do. Mm -hmm. And I know how to get a very good sound and a very good um, recording mm -hmm. from this. So that's what I do is um, I do the music for myself initially. And then I have people who really play it well. Well, isn't that just uh, one of the best kind of combinations of, of talent is to identify what really is a good song, what makes yeah. a good composition, oh, yeah. and bringing the best people to be able to perform yeah. that. Yes. And um, was there a particular kind of focus for you? Yeah, there is. Um, I am absolutely mad about melody. Mm. It's melody. Mm -hmm. Everything. It's not beat. Um, harmony is a signpost for me to show where the melody may should go. Um, I'm intensely uh, into what's lyrical mm -hmm. and uh, um, as I said that feeling from listening to the Adagio all those years ago never left me. It really goes to show that you know your passion being music yeah, yeah. it's something that might appear in different forms work-wise you know, yeah, as yeah. a producer but now as a composer and performer. Yeah. Uh, I'm curious where you see yourself going next. Ah, well, I tell you what, what it is, Susan, it's allowing yourself to be open mm. to what can happen. It happened only a, a, a few years ago. Uh, a fan I'd never met called me out from uh, Florida and he said, Michael, uh, your music has meant a lot to me. Mm -hmm. I said, oh, thank you so much. He said, it's been a lot to me. I said, thank you. And he said, I want to help. I said, no, I don't need help. I'm okay. He mm -hmm. said, no, I would like to help. I said, no, no, I heard you. But I know I'm okay, really, I am. What did he want he, to help he, with? He said, what do you want to help? I said, he said, haven't you thought of something you want to do, which you've never done? Mm. I said, why are you asking me? He said, well, isn't there? I said, well, um, I wanted to, I'd love to record with a full orchestra, but you know, it's very expensive. Mm -hmm. He said, but tell me how much it is. Hmm. I said, why? He said, well, I'll pay for it. So I, I he said, agreed to pay for I it? I said, what's your name again? And he told me, <laughs> and I said, he said, Brian. I said, Brian, you want to pay for it? Do you want to do a business? He said, no, I don't want any business. Mm -hmm. I want to give to you, because your music has meant so much to me, something back. Mm -hmm. If you want to do a whole album with an orchestra, I'll pay for it. You're kidding me. <laughs> and this is true. And he was not kidding. Uh, no. And, uh, and the next day, I had a postcard in the mail, we were living in LA, mm -hmm. saying, you can record this orchestra in Prague mm -hmm. without going there. You can sit here in LA, there in Prague, you do it over the internet, mm -hmm. you talk to each other. And I could talk to the conductor, 
And you see all the orchestra playing, mm -hmm. and you can say to the conductor, I want less brass, more strings, please. Long story short, my friend paid for all the sessions. That's incredible. And the album went on to get a Grammy nomination. <laughs> when you live a life that's that close to your heart yes. and from your heart, yes. do you find these miracles happen? Absolutely. A lot? Absolutely. Going forward, do you expect more miracles to happen in your yes. life? Yes, uh, and if, if they will, but I don't expect them. I don't sort of uh, depend on them. Um, but, uh, but Susan, I'm not surprised by mm. Mm. And I absolutely, I feel sort of blessed that I am indeed able in this sort of self-taught way to do what I do. And it brings so much pleasure to so many people. Mm -hmm. I can't imagine anything more beautiful in my life, really. Michael, last but not least, what does music mean to you? It's life. It, it's air, darling. It's air. Um, I, I would die without it. Mm. It's, it's everything. Mm. Um, it's a sort of, um, it's, a, it's a music for me, the, what, I, what I do for, in a way of my own self. It's like a, sort of a sonic um, uh, a soundtrack. And uh, um, I feel absolutely um, blessed and um, exceptionally um, lucky to be able to do what I do. Absolutely. Mm. And I'm very grateful. Michael, it's been such a pleasure to have you on my show mm. and to hear your uh, incredible experiences and also to hear you perform and to mm. be able to see um, someone who truly loves what he does mm. for a living and is able to truly share that with mm. the world yeah. and uh, keep keep doing that. Yeah. <laughs> keep, keep on you, uh, sharing and uh, I really look forward to um, your concert and, yeah. uh, and seeing you perform in the future as well. Yeah, thanks a lot. Thank you so much. Bye, it's been such a pleasure. Bye. After talking to Michael Hope and hearing all about his life story, we had a chance to look around the museum where all the antique instruments were displayed. I don't think I've seen a collection of such amazing uh, antique instruments here. Wow. Is this something that you recognize? Wow. Well, this is a, um, a forte piano, which uh, of course uh, people like um, Beethoven wrote their music on. Mm -hmm. and. Um, and then eventually it was strengthened with a metal frame so people like Liszt uh, couldn't break them anymore. <laughs> and um, Beethoven, of course, used to break these type of pianos. And then after this came the um, um, piano forte. I see. And, uh, but this is interesting to see that Benjamin Britten owned this. Heavens. Yeah, this is a... Uh, very, very famous uh, British composer. Yeah. Oh, yes. it is a Steinway. A Steinway. Uh -huh. And then coming from uh, New York. Um, Wow. Anyway, this is a, a beautiful piano. Yeah. yeah. How, how is it? Well, a little it, out of tune. It's a little, but it, but it. It is a museum piece yeah. after all, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's still very playable. I mean, somebody um, could condition this, and mm -hmm. it would be extremely. You know, earlier we spoke a little bit about uh, the melancholy and the, the han that Koreans mm. express in music. Mm. And I'm wondering if you might be able to show me um, what yeah. uh, han looks like. Yeah, well, I'm in a han, for example, um, to get the effect of that sort of mm. Mm -hmm. um, You could just have an ordinary uh, G seventh here okay. with an E flat on top, mm -hmm. and it'll give you this sort of agony mm. sound. So like this, okay? So this is... That, that's just an ordinary thing. Now, okay. ordinary sort of G seventh chord. You put the E flat on top of it, mm -hmm. then you get your hum. Then you can hear this. Uh -huh. That kind of dissonance. Yeah. Mm. That is hum. Yes, it is. See? So that's how, that's how you get... It's the tension, basically. Mm -hmm. I mean, hum, um, any form of uh, melancholy or um, mm -hmm. any form of... The meaning in, in music has come from a sort of certain tension between mm -hmm. the notes 
and uh, having that E flat over the top mm -hmm. gives you that sort of mm, that yearning quality. Yeah. Dee, da, of course, it's got to come down, yeah. but you, if you leave it there for quite some time, dee, you think, oh, I can't stand anymore, bong, and then you go on to some <laughs> other chord. It a oh, bit, yeah. yeah. And then you sort of and you base a composition around that. Mm. Yeah, it's suspensions, mm. and that's basically what it is. And uh, suspensions that want to come home, mm -hmm. and uh, when you bring it home, then you, there's a certain release. Yeah. But the hum is right in that note. Note. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. that's how it goes. Yeah. Nice, wow. Thank you for showing me. And <laughs> that too on this beautiful Steinway. Yeah. They, they've allowed us to go inside no, right, just right. for us. Oh, <laughs> good. I'm not going to be Most people visiting the museum should not no, be doing no, that, no, right? No, sure, no, no, no. <laughs> Michael Hope lives and breathes music. With his fingertips, he is able to express and convey his emotions for all to enjoy.